Okay, let's see what you guys think. Question one, uh, this is group four's question. Why would it be important that Ender thinks of his own planet as not particularly his own, not special, just another planet? What do you think? So group four says that uh, the importance here is that when he says it's just like any other, not particularly his own, he doesn't think of the Earth as a special planet or a special place. Uh, and in this story, this means that maybe his attitude toward the aliens uh, might be different from the attitude of people who do think that Earth is special. Uh, let's read this paragraph. It's a short paragraph on page 30. He, this is uh, paragraph two. He did not know its significance at the time. Later, though, he would remember that it was even before he left Earth that he first thought of it as a planet like any other, not particularly his own. So the novel tells us that this is an important idea, but it will only become important later. Later perhaps means when he has to think about how to fight and defeat the aliens, or maybe even later near the end of the story when he regrets his actions and tries to save the last alien. This seems to be telling us that this is part of why Ender succeeds. When everyone else thinks that Earth is special, we have to defend Earth at all costs. Uh, everyone else, all of the aliens are the enemy. If they only think of the aliens as the enemy, then it's hard to find a specific strategy to uh, defeat the enemy. If you don't understand your enemy, you can't find a weakness, you can't do analysis, uh, and it's hard to think about the enemy's strategy. So that's one point. Ender is able to think about the aliens as uh, uh, just another kind of species or just another kind of uh, thinking army. And so he's able to do analysis and find their weak point. But also because he doesn't think of them as the absolute enemy. So at the end of the story, he is able and willing to try to make up for his actions, to save the last hive queen, to help the alien species regrow again. Now, uh, we have seen the movie, so we know that most of humans don't really care if the aliens are going to attack again. They only care that the aliens have the power to attack again. Uh, Ender seems to be one of the few people who really cares about what the aliens want to do or don't want to do. 
So in a sense, this is one of the key points of the morality of this novel, the novel's idea of what is right and what is wrong. Uh, it seems to be telling us that they, we should not think of someone as just the enemy. Even if we want to defeat them, it is more useful to think of them as more complicated than just the enemy. Uh, okay, so thank you, group four. Other groups, do you want to add questions or ideas? All right, then let's move on. Question two, this is group three. When Graf says human beings are free except when humanity needs them, uh, do you agree? Why or why not? And if you don't agree, or if you think Graf doesn't really believe this, why do you think he says this to Ender? I had the chance to talk to uh, today's only group three member. Uh, do you want to add or change any part of the first half of your answer? No, OK, so I'll summarize that first, OK? So group three thinks that they do agree with this idea. Uh, and group three brought up the examples of how we treat other animals. We take care of other animals when we like them or when they are useful to us. But if they are not useful, even if an animal is not a threat, like an ant, very small, very harmless, but if it, it's just annoying, we're likely to kill it anyway. So it does seem like uh, humans would treat each other the same way. Uh, we'll let you be unless we need you, and then we'll treat you differently. Something like that. Uh, okay, and then if Graf does not believe this, why do you think he says this to Ender anyway? So group three says, maybe Graf would say this anyway, because regardless of how he himself thinks about uh, morality or about human relations, if he believes that uh, humans are stuck in a kill or be killed relationship with the aliens, then he would say or do anything to get Ender to join the army and perhaps have a better chance at winning. Something like that? OK, thank you, yes. And in fact, that thought process by Colonel Graf is the same thought process that is in this statement. Human beings are free except when humanity needs them. Humanity seems to need help now, so you are not free, Ender. Um, but he only thinks that humans are not free because he is afraid of being uh, defeated because there is some other species that is able to defeat humanity. This is kind of like the Cold War, right? the US versus Soviet Russia, USSR. It doesn't matter whether uh, the leadership of the other side actually does want to destroy you. The point is that they can destroy you, so we should be ready. And that's the kind of logic in the Cold War. Uh, but of course, there are many problems with that logic, because if it's a, it's a kind of prisoner's dilemma. You didn't chou fan nan ti, right? If I think they'll defeat me, and if they think I'll defeat them, then nobody will want to try to uh, stop fighting. So the logic of Colonel Graf is what creates this idea. If we need you, you are not free. Uh, 
Uh, let's take a closer look at this on page 35. Um, near the bottom, there's a slightly longer paragraph that begins with no, of course not. No, of course not. This is Colonel Graff who's talking. No, of course not. So I'll put it bluntly. Human beings are free except when humanity needs them. Maybe humanity needs you to do something. Maybe humanity needs me to find out what you're good for. We might both do despicable things, Ender, but if human humankind survives, then we were good tools. We might both do terrible things, but if humankind survives, then we were good tools. Ender asks, is that all just tools? Grab says, individual human beings are all tools that the others use to help us all survive. Ender says, that's a lie. Grab says, no, it's just a half truth. You can worry about the other half after we win this war. So it does seem like Graf knows that this logic is limited, but because he feels threatened, he's still willing to follow this logic. OK, thank you, group three. Other groups, do you have ideas or questions? OK, let's move on. Question three. Group three, mixed advice. Do you think it's good advice? What, if it's not good advice, what might happen to someone who follows that advice? Okay, <clears throat> so I don't think that Andrew would take mixed advice. So as we can see in the novel, so actually Mick is, he say to himself, he said he's nothing. And he doesn't, let me say he doesn't play an important role in, in, in the novel. So actually he said, I am a fart in the air conditioning and I'm always there, but most of the time nobody knows it. So, and uh, actually he said he got nowhere. He said that he would be pretty soon going to a technical school uh, from from here. So, so another school. <laughs> yeah, no way it'll be technical school. Oh yeah, that's right. So uh, we can we can see from the evidence. So the MIG isn't quite amb ambitious. However, I think that Andrew is quite different in his and Andrew's mind. He doesn't he doesn't like uh, Mick because he I, I think that he has uh, different plans for his future. He said there was no chance he would end up like that. So he knew the teacher has plans for for him. So he doesn't want to be a bugger as Mick uh, in the in the launch. So he said he didn't. Uh, leave there and um, he didn't leave Valentine and the mother and father to come here to be to be iced. So so based on the, the evidence I see, I think the Andrew Mick they didn't see eye to eye about their future. So that means the Andrew will not of course you will not take a mix uh, advice. So yeah, that's what okay thank you. So you don't think Andrew will take Mick's advice because Mick is an example of what Andrew does not want to be. That's not the question. The question is, do you think it is good advice? So I was going to say that advice for, for, for Andrew because he, he doesn't want to be the one like Mick, right? So if he doesn't like him, and then I, I can see he said he want to be he doesn't want to be ice because he leave he leave the house he doesn't want to be nothing right he doesn't want to be the bugger in his team. Oh, mm -hmm. <laughs> Perhaps that's what, what I see if I can find that in in the book right. So let's take a, let's mm -hmm. take a thank you. So it is true in this context. 
everything is telling us, the reader, that this is bad advice. But what exactly is this advice? Let's take a closer look. Page 43, paragraph 4. Listen, little guy. I'm doing you a favor. Make friends. Be a leader. Kiss butts if you've got to. Joseph Paimapia. But if the other guys despise you, you know what I mean? So the specific advice seems to be make people like you. No matter how you do it, you can make friends, which is equals. You can be a leader, which is you are above other people. You can also kiss butts, which means you are below other people. So whether you're the same, better or worse, you have to make people like you. This seems to be mixed advice. Now, do you think that this advice is good advice? So as we can see from the, the movie, right? It seems that at the beginning, uh, Andrew has difficulty finding new friends and enemies. He doesn't talk so much and he doesn't be so, so social enough, right? So I think that maybe to be the friend, to, to make friends is quite important because you, if you want to, to be a leader, you need to make friends or he, he can make, you know, to be friends doesn't mean that just be friends. You have to know, know the, the one that you want to make friends with. So if you want to be a leader, you got to get acquaintance with different kinds of friends and know what they are good at. So I was thinking that if you want to make friends, they will, I, I think that would be good advice for, for Ander himself. Thank you. So I think you're saying that one third of mixed advice is good advice, which is the make friends part. But uh, the other parts, when you're a leader, you have to make people like you. If you're a follower, you have to make people like you. Maybe that's not good. Maybe it, it's slightly different if there's a leadership situation. Uh, actually, we'll get back to this in question five. Um, but it, so actually, there's a there's a second half to this question, right? If Ender is a leader and he cares a lot about whether his followers like him, or if he is a follower and he cares a lot about whether his leader likes him, what do you think would happen to him? Would it be a good result or a bad result? Well, I, I don't think that a good leader should be liked by anyone, <laughs> like a graph, right? He seems that he doesn't want to make Ender to like him, right? If you want to be a leader, sometimes you know you, to, you have to be to play an active role or something. So if you want just want to make people like you, there will be something that you, you cannot do it. Yeah. The father will like you. I think it's 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 important, but not. If I am a follower, mm -hmm. should I care whether my leader likes me? Probably. <laughs> Do I think that he will like me? How about trust me? <laughs> yeah. Okay. Thank you. So yes, it, after thinking about it, it does seem like if there's a leadership situation, being liked by other people may not be the most important thing. As you said, being a leader, more importantly, is, uh, what, what was it? Like, um, they respect you, right? They follow you. Being a follower, it's more important to be trusted by your leader. Uh, you said if a leader cares too much about being liked, uh, there may be some things that the leader cannot do that maybe they should do. So it's not necessarily good leadership to always be liked. Right? In Chinese, we call this xiangrin, right? So yeah, it does seem like this in general is not good advice. And if Ender does follow this advice exactly, he probably wouldn't become a good leader. OK, thank you. Uh, you guys want to add anything? Other groups, questions? All right, let's move on to question four, group one. Uh, again, group one, we only have one member today. Uh, do you want to add something to what you told me earlier? OK, so I had the chance to talk with group one earlier, and this is their answer to question four. 
uh, so in this part, uh, Ender goes to like the arcade room, the game room. He play. He watches a few older boys play a game. He thinks this game is not too hard. He can probably learn it, but he'll probably take two tries to beat the other guys because it's one thing to know, but it's another thing to actually do it. So he, he uh, plays against the older boy once he loses, but while losing, he learns and he uses what he learns to win the second time. And after this, the book says, on page 47. Uh, near the bottom, three paragraphs from the bottom. When the game ended, one of the older boys said, about time they replaced this machine, getting so any pin brain can beat it now. Not a word of congratulation, just total silence as Ender walked away. So usually when you play a game against someone and you lose, the polite thing to say is like good game or you know, thanks for playing, something like that, to be polite. But here, the older boys are not polite. In fact, it seems like they're kind of angry that they got beaten by this younger guy. Uh, and the question here is why do you think Ender notices this point? Why is it important to him how these older boys react. Well, when we think about older boys, group one told us or told me um, that we can also think about the most important older boy in Ender's life, Peter. The older brother he had to grow up with. We talked about Peter last time. He's like a, a psychopath, angry all the time, likes to bully people. So it seems like Ender's relationship with older boys might be a very careful relationship. He maybe sees older boys as a kind of threat, and he always wants to try to protect himself. So when these older boys don't congratulate him, when they're not polite, maybe Ender thinks of them as a potential threat. When they don't do what is expected, how can we expect them to always be peaceful? And uh, th there's a bigger reason why this is important, not just for Ender, but also for us, the reader, which is when you meet someone who's better than you, there are a few ways you can react. Yes, you can get angry, but getting angry doesn't really help you. You can make friends with them. You can try to learn from them. Uh, but getting angry is the worst choice. So this tells the reader that not only is Ender smarter in strategy, he's also smarter in seeing how other people could help him. These older boys don't just know, uh, don't just lose to Ender on the game. They also lose to Ender in leadership growth, in becoming a good leader. OK, uh, if you don't have questions, let's take a short break.
Okay, we have one question left. Group five is still not here, so I guess I'm going to answer this question. The question is, how would you explain how Ender deals with the problem of Bernard? Try to include more than just Ender versus Bernard in your answer. So in the story, Bernard is the bully of the group. It says that he goes around terrorizing people. Nobody likes him, but everyone is afraid of him. Some people try to uh, get on his good side, make sure that Bernard does not get angry at them. But Ender is not one of those people. He tries to find a way to uh, dislodge Bernard from the leadership position. So how does he do it? First on page 50, he uh, anonymously insults Bernard. And this is like the first act of rebellion. This tells everyone that uh, they are not alone in hating Bernard. Somebody else also hates him and is willing to insult him, even if it is only anonymous. But the key moment where Ender changes the hierarchy of this group is when they first enter the battle room. Everybody in the battle room starts from zero. Nobody has been there before. Nobody knows what to do. And we saw this in the movie also, right? Ender figures out some aspects of moving around, figures out how to use the laser gun. Uh, but the way that he figures things out is not by himself. He works with someone else. He works with a lie. They manage to learn about the battle room uh, faster than everyone else. And it's because they work together. Uh, and in the book, they are able to shoot everyone else uh, before Graf calls them back to the front. So this shows everyone that Bernard is not the most powerful, is not like the best leader. These two, Alai and Ender, uh, get ahead further than Bernard does, and they are even able to uh, successfully attack Bernard and his group. So by this action, uh, Ender and Ally show everyone that in fact Bernard is not worth following. Uh, let's look at page 61. Um, Ally uh, takes the lead and they later decide to include Bernard in their group. And this is also important. If they decided to just fight Bernard, and they win, then it might lead to a situation where there are two groups, people who follow Bernard and people who follow a lie. But by including Bernard, uh, they show everyone else that they are in fact one group. So on page 61, two paragraphs from the bottom. Ender noticed that it was assumed that Bernard and Ally were the leaders of the battle. Well, that was fine. Bernard knew that Ender and Ally had learned to use the guns together. And Ender and Ally were friends. Now others might believe that Ender had joined his group, but it wasn't so. Ender had joined a new group, Ally's group. Bernard had joined it too. So by helping a lie learn faster and take the initiative, and by including Bernard in that group, they take Bernard from the top position and move him down. Instead, the person at the top is a lie. Now, you might be thinking, Ender helped. Why isn't Ender at the top? And it's because uh, 
and it shows a lie because a lie was already kind of friends with Bernard. If I can find where it is. Can't find it, but somewhere it says that a lie was already friends with Bernard, but did not follow him closely, kind of like um, half friends. So a lie was already closer to the top than Ender was. It's only natural that when Bernard is taken down, a lie would be the person to be pushed to the top and not Ender. So at the bottom of page 61, the last paragraph, uh, the novel describes what it means for a lie to be the top and not Bernard. It wasn't obvious to everyone. Bernard still blustered and sent his cronies on errands. But a lie now moved freely through the whole room. And when Bernard was crazy, a lie could joke a little and calm him down. When it came time to choose their launch leader, a lie was the almost unanimous choice. Bernard soaked for a few days and then he was fine and everyone settled into the new pattern. The launch was no longer divided into Bernard's in-group and Ender's outcasts. A lie was the bridge. So how does Ender deal with Bernard? Not by defeating him, not like he dealt with the bully on Earth, but by helping to create a new group that would also include Bernard, but not as the leader. And if Bernard is not the leader, then the, le the actual leader could control him, to keep him in control. So for Ender, the important point is not to become the leader. The important point is to find a leader who uh, is more friendly to him. And the person he chooses is a lie. OK, do you guys have questions about this? This is uh, actually a very subtle analysis of group dynamics over the course of just a few pages. It's very economical writing and analysis. OK, uh, so we have a little more time. Let's go back to the start of page, sorry, chapter four. And we'll look more closely at this chapter. Um, before that, um, I wanted to like make a small commercial. So next semester, I'm offering a few courses. Um, I'm offering two classes of writing four. So if you have not yet taken writing four, you're welcome to come. I only have like three or four open slots left. Can I own uh, but you know, if you don't want to come, don't come. I, I don't want so many students. Too much work. Uh, I'm also offering um, film literature, which is basically we just watch movies and talk about them. And at the end of the semester, you have to work with a group to make your own short movie. Could be fun. Uh, well, I, I planned it out. We're going to watch 12 movies in that semester could be interesting. Uh, and then one other course I'm offering is called British Important Writers Works. Uh, and this is an elective British literature course. Uh, we're going to be reading some works of literature that are a bit harder. Um, we're going to read a Renaissance play, so a play from the time of Shakespeare, but not a Shakespeare play. We're going to read Paradise Lost by John Milton, which is an epic. And we're going to read a Jane Austen novel called Persuasion. It's an Austin uh, Shaw. It's the hardest class that I teach. But if you're up for a challenge, I welcome you to come. OK, let's look at chapter four, page 27. So again, 
we start with these two strangers talking about Ender. The first person says, with Ender, we have to strike a delicate balance. Isolate him enough that he remains creative. Otherwise, we'll adopt the system here and we'll lose him. So in previous chapters, we heard them say that they have to isolate Ender, keep him alone, make him believe that nobody will ever help him. Here we learn why. They want to make him creative. They want him to solve his own problems. And they especially want him to remain separate from the existing system of battle school. Because they want someone better. They don't want someone who is the best in this system. They want someone who is better than the system. So by isolating him, they are forcing him to become creative, to solve problems in a way that may not fit in the existing system. That's what they want. It says if he adopts the system here, they'll lose him. This also tells us they know that most of these kids in battle school are not going to be the next leader of the army. They know that the entire school is full of mediocre kids who are better than kids on Earth, but are very similar to the other kids here in battle school. They want someone better than all of these people. They want someone better so badly they're not willing to trust their own system. They design a system and then they want someone to be better than that system. So that's the first half. That's why they need to isolate him. But continuing on line three, at the same time, we need to make sure he keeps a strong ability to lead. This is interesting. They want to isolate him, but they also are afraid that if they isolate him too much, he won't be able to lead. Why not? Leadership is a relationship between people. If they isolate Ender too much and he's not able to form relationships with others, then as group two mentioned, other people wouldn't trust him. He wouldn't be able to lead. So this is the balance that they're trying to, to strike. On the one hand, don't let him trust the system, make him solve his problems creatively. On the other hand, they still have to let him be able to build relationships with other people. This seems to be the core design of uh, Ender's education so far. And in response to this analysis, the other person says, if he earns rank, he'll lead. If we promote him, if we give him that leader like a uh, sign on his shoulder, people will follow him. But the first person disagrees. The first person says, it isn't that simple. Mazer Rackham could handle his little fleet and win. By the time this war happens, there will be too much, even for a genius. Too many little boats. He has to work smoothly with his subordinates. He has to work smoothly with his followers. So this tells us that these two people think about leadership in two different ways. The first person thinks of leadership as a relationship of trust, people willing to uh, work well with their leader. But the second person simply thinks that leadership is following orders. If I tell you to do something, you do it, and that's leadership. So we have two different ideas of leadership here. And then the second person replies with sarcasm. Oh good, he has to be a genius and nice too. Not nice. Nice will let the bugger have us all. So you're going to isolate him. I'll have him completely separated from the rest of the boys by the time we get to the school. 
I have no doubt of it. I'll be waiting for you to get here. I watched the vids of what he did to the Stilson boy. This is not a sweet little kid you're bringing up here. That's where you're mistaken. He's even sweeter than he looks. But don't worry, we'll purge that in a hurry. Uh, this is kind of joking, but he's kind of serious. Uh, he's serious that Ender is not as terrible as he looks when he's fighting. And he's also serious that maybe Ender shouldn't be so nice and so sweet. Uh, but he's kind of joking because he's talking about doing something terrible to Ender in a very lighthearted, positive tone. Well, it will make him not so nice. Sometimes I think you enjoy breaking these little geniuses. There is an art to it, and I'm very, very good at it, but enjoy? Well, maybe. When they put back the pieces afterward and it makes them better. You're a monster. Thanks. Does this mean I get a raise? Just a medal. The budget isn't inexhaustible. So this opening is doing two things. One, it's telling us the plan for Ender after he gets to battle school. And the second thing is it is adding a bit of humor to this dialogue in order for us to not feel like this is the author talking to the reader. Right? By adding some funny aspects to this dialogue, it makes these two speakers more like characters and not simply the author telling us the answer to what he's going to do in the rest of the book. It actually also does a third thing. It tells us who one of these people are because it says. I'll have him completely separated from the rest of the boys by the time we get to the school. So. One of these speakers is not at the battle school, but he is with Ender. Who is the only international fleet officer we know who is with Ender right now? Graf. So that sentence tells us one of these speakers is Colonel Graf. And then at the end it says, thanks, does this mean I get a raise? This is what Graf says. So this tells us that the other person is Graf's boss or his superior. So this tells us that Graf is in continual communication with leaders in the international fleet. Ender is so important that Graf has to give uh, periodic reports about what he's doing with Ender, even when Graf is simply bringing Ender to battle school. So in chapter one last week, we mentioned how these uh, unidentified speakers seem to be uh, in control. They have authority, they have power, but we don't know who they are. Now at the beginning of chapter four, we are starting to get an idea. In the story, Graf is the most important person. But in these dialogues, Graf is talking with people even more important than he is. So this gives us a, a sense of a bigger world or a bigger scope to this story. Most of the time we're following around this little kid, but in these chapter openings, uh, it reminds us that it's not just one person's story. There is a whole world of people who think that Ender is very important. OK, let's start the chapter uh, specifically. They say that weightlessness can cause disorientation, especially in children whose sense of direction isn't yet secure. This sentence is hilarious. I love this sentence. This sentence is about disorientation in children. How children might get confused. They don't know what to think, what to do. This book was written for teenagers which are a kind of children. 
And at the beginning of this chapter, we don't know where they are. We don't know who is with Endor. We don't know what they're doing. The only thing we get is this very confusing sentence. So basically what's happening is this sentence about children being confused is itself making children confused. I just think that's kind of funny. Uh, and then in the second sentence, we begin the story. But Ender was disoriented before he left Earth's gravity, before the shuttle launch even began. There were 19 other boys in his launch. They filed out of the bus and into the elevator. Okay, so now we have our details about this scene. 20 people per launch. They're getting out of a bus into an elevator. Supposedly they're walking toward their shuttle. Because uh, if, if you're in a bus, that means you're traveling in a group. If you get into an elevator, that means you're either going up or down. So they're getting close to their shuttle. They talked and joked and bragged and laughed. Ender kept his silence. So this already tells us Ender does not think or act like most other boys. He noticed how Graf and the other officers were watching them, analyzing. Everything we do means something, Ender realized. Them laughing, me not laughing. So again, Ender is observant and he's practical. He doesn't observe things just for fun. He's observing things for how they impact or affect himself. And he realizes that everything they do is being analyzed. He toyed with the idea of trying to be like the other boys, but he couldn't think of any jokes and none of theirs seemed funny. Again, he's very different from everyone else. Wherever their laughter came from, Ender couldn't find such a place in himself. He was afraid and fear made him serious. That also seems kind of important. Fear makes him serious. They had dressed him in a uniform, all in a single piece. It felt funny not to have a belt cinched around his waist. He felt baggy and naked dressed like that. So this paragraph looks like it's just going to be a lot of description. There were TV cameras going, perched like animals on the shoulders of crouching, prowling men. Notice the words used here. Uh, it perched like animals on the shoulders of men. Um, although there's only one kind of animal we would say is perching on someone's shoulders, a bird. And uh, from this description, it seems like Ender is thinking of birds of prey, Ying, birds that might attack people. So this imagery is not a friendly image. It's a kind of um, dangerous, anxious kind of imagery. Even the men holding the cameras are, are uh, described using this imagery. They're crouching, they're prowling like a lion or a tiger. The men moved slowly, cat-like. Again, big cats, lions, tigers. So the camera motion would be smooth. Ender caught himself moving smoothly too. This is also uh, quite interesting. We just heard Ender think that he doesn't know any jokes. So it seems like he's a very serious kid. But here he also finds himself starting to play. Right? Uh, he caught himself moving smoothly too. He's playing with his, using his body to play uh, unconsciously. So this little detail tells us that he may be a genius, he may be different from most people, but he's still human. He still also likes to have a little fun. He imagined himself being on TV in an interview. The announcer asking him, how do you feel, Mr. Wigan? Actually, quite well, except hungry. Hungry? Uh, 
Oh yes, they don't let you eat for 20 hours before the launch. So I mean, this is kind of fun, right? He's imagining something, but it's also giving us information. They have not eaten in 20 hours. How interesting, I never knew that. All of us are quite hungry, actually. And all the while during the interview, Ender and the TV guy would slink along smoothly in front of the cameraman, taking long, light strides. The TV guy was letting him be the spokesman for all the boys, though Ender was barely competent to speak for himself. For the first time, Ender felt like laughing. Okay, so Ender finds a, a kind of humor in this situation. Uh, but the reason that he's smiling and laughing is not like because he thinks that their situation is fun or exciting. It's because of something he himself imagines in his head. So compared to the other boys who are talking and laughing together, Ender is laughing because of something he himself has thought of. Again, separate and different from the other boys. He smiled. The other boys near him were laughing at the moment too, for another reason. They think I'm smiling at their joke, thought Ender, but I'm smiling at something much funnier. Uh, and this is a small peek into Ender's ego. He can't help thinking that what he thought of is much funnier than what other people are laughing at. Uh, this is also quite an interesting idea that Ender realizes people can do the same thing for different reasons. That might also apply to the larger events of the novel. Why does uh, why do all of these people want to fight the aliens? Maybe they each have different reasons. Why do the aliens uh, not attack the humans a third time? Maybe they have their own reasons. I think this is actually a very important idea that we should always try to remember that people do or do not do things for various kinds of reasons. So like, for example, why did someone like commit a crime? Is it because they're evil? Or maybe they have their own reasons. Go up the ladder one at a time, said an officer. When you come to an aisle with empty seats, take one. There aren't any window seats. It was a joke. The other boys laughed. This is also kind of interesting because the other boys know that it's a joke. Ender knows that it's a joke. He just doesn't think it's funny. But we readers don't know it's a joke. We do not see the rocket or the shuttle. We do not see the lack of windows. So of course, when we read this, we don't laugh. We don't know the situation. We don't know that it's funny. And because we don't laugh, and Ender doesn't laugh, this reaction puts us on the side of Ender. Maybe at first we think Ender is kind of weird, right? The other kids are laughing, talking. Ender doesn't see what's so funny. Seems like he's the weird guy. But with this detail, with this trick, uh, we now agree with Ender. He doesn't think it's funny. We also don't think it's funny. Of course, it's for different reasons, but because our reaction is the same as Ender's, we start to identify with him. We start to feel like he does. A very small trick that the author is using. Ender was near the last, but not the very last. The TV cameras did not give up, though. Will Valentine see me disappear into the shuttle? He thought of waving at her, of running to the cameraman and saying, can I tell Valentine goodbye? He didn't know that it would be censored out of the tape if he did, for the boys soaring out to battle school were all supposed to be heroes. They weren't supposed to miss anybody. Ender didn't know about the censorship, 
but he did know that running to the cameras would be wrong. So this paragraph tells us the same thing that he, um, his fight with Stilson told us. He knows that there are some unspoken rules, Qian Guizhe. He doesn't know how he knows them. He doesn't know why these rules are there, but he does feel that there are some rules that have not been explained. So he's not uh, completely unaware of the social world. He does have a social sense. Uh, and this paragraph also tells us that there is media censorship. He walked the short bridge to the door in the shuttle. He noticed that the wall to his right was carpeted like a floor. That was where the disorientation began. The moment he thought of the wall as a floor, he began to feel like he was walking on a wall. He got to the ladder and noticed that the vertical surface behind it was also carpeted. I am climbing up the floor, hand over hand, step by step. And then for fun, he pretended that he was climbing down the wall. He did it almost instantly in his mind, convinced himself against the best evidence of gravity until he reached an empty seat. So he's able to convince himself that he's working against gravity. Uh, so this shows us like the power of his imagination, his creativity. And if Graf and Graf's boss really care about Ender's creativity, this is a good sign. If he can change his mind and his belief so easily, he can probably also come up with good solutions to various problems very easily also. He found himself gripping the seat tightly, even though gravity pulled him firmly against it. Here against does not mean in the opposite direction. Against in English has two meanings. One is opposite, 反对. The other means uh, on. Like you're leaning on the wall, we would say you're leaning against the wall, call the chambi. So here gravity pulling him against the chair means gravity is pulling him into the chair. His body is uh, pushing against the chair. The other boys were bouncing on their seats a little, poking and pushing, shouting. In other words, they're being kids. And they carefully found the straps, figured out how they fit together to hold him at crotch, waist, and shoulders. So here he's talking about the seatbelt. He imagined the ship dangling upside down on the undersurface of the earth, the giant fingers of gravity holding them firmly in place. Uh, so here he's thinking about the ship like um, we might think about people in Australia, right? They're standing upside down. But we will slip away, he thought. We're going to fall off this planet. Uh, and then the paragraph about Earth being just another planet. Uh, next paragraph. Oh, I already figured it out, said Graf. He was standing on the ladder. Coming with us, and Ender asked. I don't usually come down for recruiting, Graf said. <laughs> I don't usually come down for recruiting. This also tells us and tells Ender that Ender is very important. Uh, the leader of battle school himself came to get Ender. <laughs> Uh, I'm kind of in charge there, administrator of the school, like a principal. They told me I had to come back or I'd lose my job, he smiled. So this gives us two pieces of information. One graph is not just some guy, he is the head of battle school. And the other piece of information is that graph seems to like Ender. 
it's, it's his job, but also he actually does seem to like Ender. He smiles at him. Ender smiled back. He felt comfortable with Graf. Graf was good. And he was principal of the battle school. Ender relaxed a little. He would have a friend there. Uh, by the end of this chapter, he will realize that Graf is not his friend. In fact, this paragraph is kind of preparing us for that reversal, for that switch. There's really no reason for Ender to think these thoughts so specifically. Oh, Graf is a good man. I trust him. It's kind of obvious. The point is to make us believe this, and then by the end of the chapter, uh, turn Graf into like someone terrible. And so that we also feel with Ender that sense of betrayal. Um, but anyways, Ender is still thinking about uh, how good Graf is in the next paragraph. Adults help the other boys belt themselves in place, those who hadn't done as Ender did. Then they waited for an hour while a TV at the front of the shuttle introduced them to shuttle flight, the history of space flight, and their possible future with the great starships of the IF. Very boring stuff. Ender has seen such films before. Which is true, right? You've got to be thinking that uh, this kind of material would have been available to these kids before they got on a starship to go to battle school. This seems like a kind of late time to introduce them to space travel. Um, to me, this tells us how stupid the army uh, bureaucracy is. Like somebody in the military thought it would be necessary for the boys be just before they go to space to learn about the history of space travel. To me, that just seems quite stupid. And so maybe this is why and at the beginning, Graf says that they want to make Ender better than the system. Because it looks like the system kind of sucks. So Ender had seen such films before, except that he had not been belted into a seat inside the shuttle, hanging upside down from the belly of Earth. So he's still imagining his new directions. The launch wasn't bad, a little scary. Some jolting or a few moments of panic that this might be the first failed launch since the early days of the shuttle. The movies hadn't made it plain how much violence you could experience lying on your back in a soft chair. Then it was over, and he really was hanging by the straps, no gravity anywhere. But because he had already reoriented himself, he was not surprised when Graf came up the ladder backward, as if he were climbing down to the front of the shuttle. Nor did it bother him when Graf hooked his feet under a rung and pushed off with his hands so that suddenly he swung upright as if this were an ordinary airplane. So we may not have a clear picture of what Graf is doing, but we do get the idea that he's deliberately spinning in different directions. Why? To create the effect in the next paragraph. The reorientations were too much for some. One boy gagged, which means to, to act like he's about to throw up. Ender understood then why they had been forbidden to eat anything for 20 hours before the launch. Vomiting in no gravity wouldn't be fun. But for Ender, Graf's gravity game was fun. And he carried it further, imagining that Graf was actually hanging upside down from the center aisle, and then picturing him sticking straight out from a sidewall. Gravity could go any which way, however I want it to go. I can make Graf stand on his head and he doesn't even know it. What do you think is so funny, Wigan? Graf's voice was sharp and angry. So this is a direct contrast to like the happy and warm graph and on the previous page. Graph is suddenly angry. What did I do wrong, thought Ender? Did I laugh out loud? I asked you a question, soldier, barked Graf. 
Oh yes, this is the beginning of the training routine. And it had seen some military shows on TV, and they always shouted a lot at the beginning of training before the soldiers and the officer became good friends. So at this point, Ender is still expecting to be good friends with Graf. It also tells us that he knows a little bit about military culture. Yes, sir, Ender said. Well, answer it then. I thought of you hanging upside down by your feet. I thought it was funny. It sounded stupid now with Graf looking at him coldly. To you, I suppose it is funny. Is it funny to anybody else here? Murmurs of no. Well, why isn't it? So this is the first surprise. We expect him to like be mean at Ender, but here he's actually saying that everyone else is wrong and that Ender is right. Graf looked at them all with contempt. Scum brains. That's what we've got in this launch. Pinheaded little morons. Only one of you had the brains to realize that in no gravity, directions are whatever you conceive them to be. So that's an important point, right? When you're in no gravity, directions do not depend on gravity. You can decide your own directions. And Ender has figured this out himself. This reminds me of a story about uh, airplane, airplane pilots in World War I. The First World War is the first war with airplanes. And according to legend, new pilots would remember to look left and right for the enemy, but they would forget to look up and down. They were so used to fighting on land that they forgot that they were now in the air and there might be enemies above them and below them. So like every evolution or advance in human consciousness is not natural. Somebody had to think of it. There had to be training. People had to be taught. That's how human culture advances. That's how humans improve generation after generation. And apparently in this generation, uh, Ender is slightly ahead of everyone else. Let's stop here. Do you have questions about uh, what we talked about uh, so far? Okay, so before next week, please finish up to chapter nine.